there's a science that underpins improving patient safety. It's a science that unfortunately many of us as clinicians aren't taught. But there's a great history of very sound theory to guide us. It's theories that we draw from human factors and sociology and clinical medicine. And we've simplified those in this program to four key principles. One, safety is a property of the system. Two, that you need to recognize some very simple principles of designing safe systems. The next principle that we want you to understand is that those ideas of designing safe systems don't just apply to our technical work, they also apply to our teamwork. So forget the jargon and all these acronyms. If you understand the principles of designing safe teamwork, you could apply it in a variety of situations. And lastly, we want you to understand that is teams make wise decisions with diverse and independent input. And so that's why it's so important to involve patients and their families, and nurses, the whole care team to put their insights in. You will ultimately make with the family the decision, but you'll make a wiser decision if you have broad input. The recent progress made in improving safety in airline travel is mostly due to better communication and equality between the pilot and the co-pilot. This wasn't always the case. On January 13, 1982, in Washington, D.C., Air Florida Flight 90 was preparing to depart. While the co-pilot repeatedly expressed concerns about icy wings, the pilot ignored seven different admonitions. The plane went down in the icy Potomac River. The National Transportation Safety Board conducted a post-crash study and found that the airline industry had an exceedingly hierarchical culture in which many pilots did not value what co-pilots had to say and thus they ignored them. In medicine, we also have a hierarchical system that needs to change. This module will explore how we can improve and understand the science of safety by understanding how each system is designed to achieve exactly the results that it gets. System level factors that impact patient safety include characteristics of the patient, of the provider, of the care team, and the work environment, and also institutional and external pressures. As highlighted in the aviation example, team level characteristics seem to be critically important. In healthcare, the majority of sentinel events, those events that cause significant harm to patients, occur because of communication errors. All of these factors can either defend against or put patients at risk. A careful and honest review of these factors will enhance patient safety. Teams from Michigan hospitals were some of the first to implement CUSP. We were offered uh, to participate in the CUSP project and we had done a safety attitude questionnaire and we had a department, the surgical department, that fell to the bottom of the list of the report as far as their safety culture. And we felt this was the perfect opportunity to start with this particular department. So we talked to our leadership. The budgets weren't that great. They were very reluctant to start a new project. But when we showed them the evidence and the scores, and we were so excited, and we brought them over, and they enabled us to join the project, and we're very glad that we did. A couple of things that we look at from an administrative standpoint is really cost, access, and quality. And you know, quality is very important to us and the patient's safety, but you have to balance that with how much it costs you as well as an organization. And so some of the things that we were struggling with at the time, like many hospitals, uh, we were in a deficit spending mode. Uh, we were losing a little bit of money at the time. Uh, so you start looking at staffing and, and trying to reduce your expenses, which are also very important to us. But then you also have to look at how do you benefit the patient? How do you create a safer environment? And from an administrative standpoint, if we can provide safer care, it's better care, and hopefully in the long run, it actually cost organizations and really the federal government less money on health care if we can provide better care. Some of the environmental issues that we faced were some staffing issues. We had some traffic control issues as far as uh, 
how people entered and, and left the departments. One issue was we had an open hallway right off the recovery room where staff just got used to going through there for their breaks, which was a, an infection control, a privacy um, issue, a lot of safety issues with that. As we have heard from my friends in Michigan, examining the characteristics of your system is the first step to understand the factors that put your patients at risk. Just as aviation elevated the co-pilot's role in the cockpit, we need to elevate the concerns of the entire care team and the patients and their families to a higher level. In the next section, we will examine some of the basic principles of safe design. There's a wealth of theory and ideas of how to improve patient safety. But as busy clinicians, we need to recognize some basic principles of designing safe systems. We will cover three main principles, which are standardize care whenever you can, create independent checks for things that are important, and learn don't just recover when things go wrong. We're really good at recovering from mistakes. It's what we do most of our day as clinicians. We're not so good at learning from them, that is reducing the risk that future patients will be harmed. The CDC has recommendations to reduce the risk of an infection when placing a central line. Part of those recommendations require the use of about eight pieces of equipment, a cap, a mask, a hat. Well, when I looked, I had to go to eight different places to get all that equipment, and half the time they weren't stocked. And when they weren't stocked, I made an economic decision, which in my mind was completely rational. I said, is it worth me running down the hall, spending 10 minutes to go get a supply, or is it worth just going without it? The mistake was making clinicians have to make that decision. So what did we do? Well, first we standardized care by creating a line cart. That is, we stored all the equipment that clinicians needed when placing this catheter, and we made it easy to do the right thing. The idea of independent checks is based on the idea that we're all fallible. Think of a seatbelt. The evidence that we should buckle our seatbelt is overwhelming, but we get busy and we forget to do it. What happens when you forget to buckle your seatbelt? you hear this annoying sound that is highly effective in making you buckle your seatbelt. Unfortunately, we forget things far too often in healthcare delivery that are mission critical. Creating independent checks ensures that there are reminders and checks for procedures that are essential for patient safety. Yet to be effective, they must truly be independent and we must use intraprofessional roles, all the care team questioning each other. One of the big issues that we had was babies being born before 39 weeks with issues that required them being transferred to tertiary care. So across the country they were talking about a um, program where you didn't want to deliver the babies before 39 weeks without a medical indication. And this was something that was being done frequently. So one of the checks that we've done is that uh, when a patient wants to be electively induced or has an elective C-section, that um, chart comes over to the department. We review the chart and the due dates to make sure those dates are accurate. So this allowed us to have a better culture and results of our babies. We are seeing babies who are born healthier. Of course, we get premature babies, but those babies were born premature um, um, by nature. We really had to work with the team and physicians about booking the inductions, empowering the nurses to be able to say, you can't put this induction on the books because this mother is not 39 weeks, and to be able to talk to the physician and why we don't want to do that and get them on board with it. When mistakes occur, clinicians routinely recover from them. But rather than determining that that's just the way things are, we need to learn from situations when things go wrong. We need to learn from our defects. 
A very practical way to learn from defects is by asking four simple questions. What happened? Why did it happen? That is, what systems were involved? What did you do to reduce risk using those principles of safe design? And how do you know that it worked? That is, how do you know you actually reduced risk? We have many examples of how routines were changed when units learned from their mistakes and made changes to the system, reducing the risk that patients will be harmed. So in this unit, we have ongoing improvement uh, work that happens here in the WICU by asking the nurses how they think the next patient is going to be harmed and what we can do to prevent that harm from happening. But I'm going to give you an example of a time when we didn't see how the next patient was going to be harmed. So there was a nurse who brought in his medications, antibiotic and a vasopressor that were in similar IV bags. He then went to do something to his patient, and he came back to grab his antibiotic. He spiked it, he hung it, and he went about taking care of his patient. He then noticed that his patient's blood pressure was going way up. He tried to figure out immediately what had happened, and as he was retracing his steps, he realized that he had grabbed the wrong medication. He grabbed the vasopressor and hung it on straight tubing and was infusing it at a very fast rate. He immediately stopped it, called for help, and the patient recovered. When we sat down as a team to debrief after that event happened, what we came up with was when we have two IV bags that look the same, we decided to make it look different somehow. And we put these orange labels on every vasopressor that arrived on the unit. So when it came up from the pharmacy, we would put this orange sticker on it. It was bright, it was a statement. And then if you brought that drug into your room, it would look different than any other drug that was there. Now, some of you may think that these three principles are an oversimplification of a very complex science. And in part, you're right. But trust me, doing these three simple things, standardizing work whenever you can, creating independent checks for things that are important, and learning, not just recovering when things go wrong, will dramatically help improve patient safety in your work area. The next principle we want you to understand is that those ideas of designing safe systems, standardizing work, creating independent checks, and learning from mistakes don't just apply to our technical work. They also apply to our teamwork. Whenever we're sending a message, the sender encodes meaning. That is, they may use ambiguous language, they may have nonverbal language, and we all do this to make it efficient. That message passes through an environment, which in healthcare is noisy and chaotic. And the message goes to a receiver who may be doing something else. They may be drawing up a medicine. They may be checking in a patient. And that receiver has to decode that message. That is, try to determine what was the intent of the sender. Anywhere along this continuum, errors could occur. And we could defend against those by applying the principles of safe design. The sender of the message could standardize how they communicate. Terms like SBAR and briefings and daily goals are nothing more than standardizing that input. And the receiver could reduce the risk of a decoding error, of a translation error, by reading back, by creating an independent check to say, this is what I understood you to mean, is that correct? The nurses who I work with all the time, if I use vague language, which unfortunately I often do, will say, Peter, you're making me decode, please be more specific and they're spot on, we need to. And when communication errors occur, we need to learn from our mistakes. That is, we need to pull together and reflect on what happened, why did it happen, what could we do differently, and how do we know that care is actually better. One of the tools that could help improve communication and teamwork is the daily goals. The idea comes from management. We know that individuals and organizations that set goals and get feedback towards those goals accomplish much more than those who don't. And yet too often, we don't apply goals to patient care, even though being in the hospital poses risks. 
Let me share with you a story of how it was applied. I made rounds with the team on a patient that had heart failure. The doctors concluded with a plan that said, let's convert the IV antihypertensive medicine to PO, let's diurese the patient, and let's try to wean their oxygen. And they walked away saying, we make rounds just fine. Those are clear goals. And I asked them, well, what were your goals yesterday? The patient had been in the ICU for three days now. And they said, well, they were to wean the antihypertensive to diurese them and get the oxygen down. And I said, how'd you do? Well, not so well, I guess. The patient was positive three liters and they're still on IV antihypertensive. I said, what if we applied this daily goal principles of being very specific about what our plan is? What might it look like? Well, instead of saying wean the antihypertensive, it would be give them 100 of a PO medication right now, and if they're not off the IV drugs by noon, let me know and we'll double the dose. Give them a diuretic now, and if we're not a third of the way towards three liters of our fluid goal, then let's increase that dose and let's wean the oxygen as the water comes off the patient. The nurses said, boy, I would love that degree of clarity. The doctor said, well, that's a much more specific way of managing it. Three months later, that ICU cut three days off their length of stay by rigorously applying the daily goals. Usually in a crisis, no matter how well trained physicians and nurses are in the heat of the battle when things are going south, you kind of lose your trend of thought. Our CUSP team actually came up with a checkoff list for the postpartum hemorrhage protocol, which I had the experience of actually putting it into practice about two weeks after we developed it. I actually had a patient who experienced a significant hemorrhage event, and the nurses promptly went to the protocol, started going through the medications, the checklist, and it worked amazingly well. And the outcome of the case was exactly what we expected. We saved the patient's life. One thing that we learned early on was to be transparent. It used to be that you would take your defects, you would take whatever error occurred, and you'd shove it in a closet. In order to actually advocate for patient safety, we had to deal with the emotions that the defects created. We're very transparent when there is an adverse event or a near miss. We do debriefings with the team involved. We do debriefings with the entire staff because there's a ripple effect. If, if I had an adverse event, it's going to affect my coworker. You really want to be able to learn from what happened. And typically we go through the root cause analysis and we look at step by step what happened and then we address the process. What can we do so that this will not happen again? And you look at everything, put an action plan together, work with the staff in rolling that out. And you want the team involved in that. Poor teamwork is the major contributing factor to patient harm in healthcare. It not only harms patients, it frustrates us, it reduces our joy in our work, and it adds unnecessary cost to care. These principles of the science of safety could help you improve teamwork. Undoubtedly, patient safety will improve, and I guarantee you, your joy in work will improve. There's a mature science that looks at how do teams make wise decisions. And in simplifying it, it boils down to two principles. Teams make wise decisions when they have diverse and independent input, and second, that they alternate between convergent and divergent thinking. Let's talk about these a bit. This idea of diverse and independent input, it's what should happen on interdisciplinary rounds, where every member of the care team contributes information and knowledge. Too often in healthcare, we believe that your formal training is the only important domain of wisdom. So the senior attending has more wisdom than residents, than students. And we forget that tacit knowledge, that is time with the patient or time with the disease, is as important a domain of wisdom. And those two hierarchies are completely reversed. The patient or their family 
leads the tacit one, not the physicians. The second concept is this ability to alternate between convergent and divergent thinking. The idea is we make a plan, but sometimes patients get sicker or things change, and we need to pause and reevaluate, say what new data we have, and make a new plan. If we do these two things, we will undoubtedly make wiser decisions for our patients. I think a big piece of promoting teamwork is to get the right people involved. Um, you know, the operating room has many different processes in place, different people don't see each other. Uh, the, the staff that actually works in the operating room doing surgical procedures doesn't always see the, the staff that are cleaning the equipment or see the, uh, the staff that are uh, in the ambulatory department that are uh, bringing patients back to the OR. And so bringing them together to understand what issues they each had, how they impacted each other, um, so we're customers to each other. Uh, was a, a big benefit to us. Uh, having the physicians also actively involved in that process uh, and championing the process to say, hey, this is important not only from a, a hospital operation standpoint, a nursing staff function, but the surgeons could see benefits of improved patient care. One neat thing about diversity is that it creates creativity. So we've come up with solutions that we might not have come up with uh, had it not been for all the diverse opinions. What I was surprised about was how well we meshed and how we would bounce ideas off of each other. I'm totally non-clinical, but being non-clinical could bring a different perspective to the idea of patient safety and the CUSP initiative. It lends to the team um, things that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to get if you were just so really rigidly clinically focused. It makes you think about things in a totally, totally different way and brings insight um, to the team and um, helps you just focus um, on a safety perspective from a to in a totally different way. So I hope you apply this science of wise decision making. That is, by ensuring in your care that you get diverse and independent input and you have a structure to ensure that you could alternate between convergent and divergent thinking.